everybody. We're uh, 20 minutes late, but we have another presentation. This is Rob Barlow. He's going to be talking about 3D printing for classic system collectors like us. Yes, 3D printing. Go, Rob. Hi, everybody. So I promise I'm going to keep this under 25 minutes. <laughs> See Why if did I can you look even, at me when you said that? Yeah, see if I can get it in even a little bit quicker. I've been told that we are running low on SD card space. <laughs> so, my name's Rob Barlow. Um, and yeah, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to um, talk a little bit about 3D printing and how it correlates to our hobby. Uh, how many people here have a 3D printer? Oh, whoa, lucky people. Actually, less than, less than I expected. Um, is that legible? Yeah. I actually did this entire presentation in a cool Amiga Topaz font that I found. <laughs> uh, and then I realized I, I actually like people, so I took that oh. font out. So, all right. Um, let's see. So, why am I making this presentation here? Uh, so, I've spoken to lots of you, lots of retro and, and vintage enthusiasts uh, about 3D printing. And I've come away with a sense that, you know, everybody has sort of different preconceptions about it. And, and some people have use cases for it. Some people don't. Some people think it's its own hobby. Some people think it's kind of a utility. Um, and I just wanted to give people ideas on how this can be used, right? How we can sort of integrate it into uh, some of the stuff that we do. Um, so I think like a lot of you, I grew up really fascinated with the microcomputers as they were coming into their own, um, starting out with like uh, schematics that you could hear about and you, you see it you see it in the news but you really couldn't see them. Later on you start seeing like the early to mid 70s there's like kits that people can get and they can make their own computers if you're really skilled and you've got some sort of support mechanism behind you. Um, not really quite there yet uh, but what happened in what the mid to latish 70s is you started seeing these companies come on with um, actual systems that they're presenting to you as if hey these are systems that uh, that you can actually pick up and use and you don't have to be you don't have to have all this esoteric knowledge to get started uh, and I think for a lot of us a lot of us might have first really encountered micros in at this stage, mm -hmm. uh, maybe in STEM labs, or you know the equivalent back then of STEM labs, or schools, or sort of some other uh, venue, uh, they were pretty expensive though, right? So uh, even though they were something that you can get in your home, you might not have had one at home. Uh, but at least this was kind of like that starting point, uh, and that starting point for a lot of us of going, wow, this is just really exciting. This is cutting edge stuff. I want, I want to be involved in it. Um, what I would say is that. We see this in the 3D printing space as well. Uh, there are a ton of parallels with 3D printing. It started out with schematics or, you know, um, academia would do these things. Uh, and if you knew how to do it, you could give it a try. Later on, you started seeing situations where you could get blueprints or you could even get kits that you can put together yourself at home if you know how. But again, what you get is kind of I don't know. I would say it's it's more hobbyist than anything else. It's not really that practical. Until some of these companies started trying to develop their own ecosystems. And so you see um, three of the early companies there who were developing systems that they said, hey, you can take this to your STEM lab. You can take this into your schools. You can take this even into your home if you can afford one um, and use it. I would say that's eh, roughly the equivalent of that, that late 70s PC era. Uh, to continue the analogy though, it wasn't until we saw a little more democratization of the technology uh, in the home computers where we get these computers that you can actually take home and use, plug in, uh, and they're affordable, or at least they're starting to get affordable. In some cases, I think they might have gotten a little too affordable because there was this sort of race to the cheapest. And so this is where we get these outliers like the Sinclair 1000 there, the first sub $100 computer, which it was a computer. I mean, it ticked all the boxes, right? <laughs> but if you were to have gotten one, it might have been more, there, there, might, there might have been more compromises than you really could <laughs> um, uh, balance for. And in the end, you may have lost your enthusiasm for uh, personal computing or home computing because of the frustration that you felt. Um, 
The same thing has been happening over the last few years in the 3D printing space. You've got these uh, 3D printers that are coming out now that they're cheaper, they're cheaper, they're cheaper. In some cases, they're too cheap, and they're making too many compromises. Uh, and if you start to, to use one of these, uh, you may find that um, you become frustrated and disenfranchised with 3D printing. If you get the right one, you might have a great outcome. Uh, or, um, depending on your personality, you, know, you might get the worst one and you might just like roll up your sleeves and like wrestle it to the ground and make it do what, <laughs> what you want it to. Um, what we're seeing now, though, is what I would say, if, if you think about what happened in the mid-80s, we had this transition from 8-bit micros to 16-bit computers, and these computers have addressed a bunch of issues that people had, a bunch of common things, speed, storage, memory, usability, all these different things. They're all addressing all these things pretty much all at once, right? So they're like bringing out this new wave of 16-bit exciting computers that you're going, wow, this is, this is like a new thing. I'm, I'm excited again for home computers. Uh, and we saw that happen with things like the, um, the Mac, the Amiga, the ST. I would say that we are right now at that stage in 3D printing. We are in what I would say is that equivalent era. Uh, the 3D printers coming out now are addressing all of these pain points uh, all at once. Now, they're not necessarily nailing it, they're not fixing everything, but by and large, these are kind of, this, we're in that 16-bit era. In fact, it's kind of an interesting side note. Up until recently, most of those printers that I was showing you uh, were controlled by 8-bit uh, microcontrollers. So they were mm. literally 8-bit mm. machines until recently. Um, all right, I don't know what's on my next slide. Oh, yeah. Uh, so really brief, I'm not going to read all of this stuff, but just pri 3D recap prime or whatever. Um, there are sort of three basic forms of additive manufacturing. Um, additive meaning basically that you, what you probably expect it to mean, which is you're laying down a pancake of material, you build another pancake of material on top of that first one, you just keep layering these slices one atop the other until you have a 3D object, right? Uh, so that is 3D printing. The, the processes are from, I guess, the, uh, the um, uh, most to least accessible, I would deem as this FDM. So FDM is the uh, plastic extrusion process. It's what this printer on the table there does. Uh, and it's the, uh, the thing that results in those prints that you see, where you look at something and you go, this was 3D printed, right? You can, you can obviously tell it was 3D printed. Uh, that's, that's that process at FDM. Um, I would say somewhere a little bit less accessible, but still getting very accessible lately is uh, MSLA, or resin printing. So this is basically just using UV light to harden resin, uh, various technologies that do that. Uh, the advantages of that are you can get faster prints, much, much more detailed prints. Um, and so there's a ton of upside. There's also some downside um, that you can probably read about there. In our hobby, the biggest downsize is dimensional accuracy. So these printers tend not to print quite as dimensionally accurate as the mm. FDM counterparts. Partially that's because even though you've got that precision of this light that you're directing to harden the resin, there is this sort of a bloom factor that tends to make mm. certain things um, a little bit uh, undersized, like holes. Uh, the other thing is the actual motion of that printing. Uh, so this is the, um, if you, you probably, if you don't know, this is the technology where it goes into a vat of liquid and it pulls the part out of it. But it's not really just pulling it straight out. It kind of appears when you see a stop most time lapse. It appears to be pulling it out. It's actually dunking, pulling, dunking, pulling. And that motion can actually introduce a little bit of um, uh, dimensional inaccuracy. Mm. The final process here is um, laser sintering. That is still prosumer plus. I would say it's still more business use. It's, it's not quite ready for like a home use if it's ever going to be. So this is taking nylon type materials that are statically charged, forming them into the shape, melting them together, and then doing that layer by layer. Um, it's got a lot of advantages. The biggest disadvantages are around cost and waste of material, actually. It uses a lot of material. 
Um, so I don't see that one being something that we do at home necessarily anytime soon. You know, I, I, I do a lot of 3D printing and I see the, uh, the, the standard at home one being for, good for, you know, designing and getting a good prototype. And if I have something that's super important, I send it off to SLS after I've proven it at home. So you send it to a service? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and there's there's some huge advantages. I would say the biggest advantage of, of what you're doing there. Other, well, I mean, there's tons of advantages, but the biggest single one is, <clears throat> depending on a lot of different factors, the prints that you get out of those resin printers and those FDM printers can be fragile. So let's talk about a little bit of um, what we can do with it. So I think some of this stuff is obvious. I'm going to start with some of the more obvious things. Uh, one of the most common uses is replacement parts and repair parts. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us, I think, here, because this is a, a commoner group, I think most of us have seen the, um, the doors on the front of our monitors broken off and missing. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly common. Uh, 3D printing uh, definitely is useful for stuff like that. Um, other small, common, broken, missing parts, floppy drive buttons, drive door levers, trim pieces, they can usually be replaced with high quality replicas that are printed in either like ABS or PET, water bottle plastic, or PLA, which is um, a more common plastic. Uh, one of the earliest repairs that I ever did was on an Amiga 3000 that just didn't have its button. So that's a photo of my very first 3D mm -hmm. printed thing that I did. And you can see how primitive it is compared to what we can do today. But that was done by sending it off to a, a service to be printed in nylon. Uh, and that's just, just a crude, <laughs> wedge-shaped button. But it served the function back in the day. Um, other stuff, though. So um, one of the things that um, might not be immediately apparent is you can print things like belts uh, on an FDM printer. Uh, you can use <laughs> TPU, which is the, the, uh, the kind of the spongy plastic they use for mm. cell phone cases, uh, and actually print something that's flexible enough to be used as a belt. I'm not sure how reliable that would be in the long term but if you're if you are needing a belt for a, for some sort of a drive or something like that and you just need it and you know the size uh, while you're waiting for one to be shipped to you you can print one and use it and try it to at least test to figure out if the thing works um, rubber feet uh, again this isn't rubber but it's rubber like um, I use this process all the time to replace feet on things or to make feet for things that didn't have feet before um, other stuff, let's see. Uh, keyboard stabilizers. Oops, I'm gonna go, sorry. Uh, keyboard stabilizers. Uh, the end caps on an SX64, <laughs> like that one, it's missing them. Um, what else, the case clips on bread bins, case clips on 1200s and 600s, uh, all that kind of stuff, 1000s uh, break actually more than you would think. Those are pretty easy to replicate. Uh, when speaking about case clips, one thing that I like to do actually is uh, I'll open up a case and sometimes the clips will be like uh, tired and I will sometimes take a file that has a replacement case clip and then cut it in half so it's just kind of a thin veneer and actually bond a veneer of that same clip over the existing clip so that that clip is reinforced and doesn't break in the future. Um, what else? Um, again, keyboard bits. Uh, Keycaps, not so much. So um, these are the key. Oops, sorry, I skipped over things like uh, uh, doors. So actually, in that photo there, uh, that's my Amiga 600. That's a trap door uh, that I printed, and it doesn't really show up in this photo, but it actually extends a few millimeters underneath the case, and that and it has some vents in it. That's intentional. That's because uh, I think individual computers makes a bunch of expansions for the 600 that oh. stack on each other, and they actually extend right to the bottom of the case and have no breathing room. Mm. So by printing this replacement trap door, I give it the space, but now the door is the thing resting on the table when I set the Amiga down, so that's a new problem. So what I've done is in white TPU, which is that spongy or plastic, I have printed uh, replacement feet that are just a few millimeters thicker than the Amiga 600's regular feet. Uh, and actually, it doesn't show in this photo, but I've hollowed them out and just stuck them over the existing feet. 
And the reason I did that is because I can take these feet off, I can take that door out, this Amiga 600 will be completely stock again if I want it to. So these are a lot of things that you can do with 3D printing that is non-destructive and, and helps just retain either the aesthetic or some of the, you know, the, the ability to sort of reverse stuff. Um, again, I, I think I talked about keys. Keycaps, I would say uh, questionable. Um, you can see those are those are the keycaps on the little mini uh, C64 on the table there. Uh, those were printed in resin. Those were a nightmare. Um, <laughs> keycaps right now, because of the profiles, because of the, just the nuances of the of the design, it's hard. If you don't want to make the keycap yourself, and you want to try to find a file, you probably won't find one that looks exactly like your keycap. Keycaps tend to be double shot, right? So there's there's a lot of characteristics about keycaps that are hard to replicate. You can do it. If you just needed a keycap and you didn't mind what it looked like, you can do it. Um, so maybe the second most common application for 3D printing, um, in this context at least, is creating enclosures for cases to keep or match the aesthetic of a system that you have, right? So this could be anything from um, a remake of an old thing that doesn't exist anymore, like a like a Mega 65. Looking at, hey, I want to I want to re recreate something that used to exist but doesn't today. Um, or things like um, enclosure, well, enclosures for new stuff. So I'm thinking like the Pi 1541. I've seen a couple of them around here. Um, you can have it just hanging out as a Raspberry Pi with some wire sticking out of it, and it's fine. Uh, but if you'd like to, you can go online and you can find actual cases that match that same design ID of a Commodore 64 or a Breadbin, Breadbin 64 or 64C or whatever. Uh, and you can get that aesthetic to match. Um, in this case here, that photo shows uh, brand new 1581 faceplates um, that have just been printed for a project that our club is doing. Um, and see, so, uh, what was I gonna say about this? So yeah, so these are printed in just PLA, uh, and then they're primed. And uh, I find that the prime priming itself levels them a bit, uh, so that they can then be sanded down and finished. They'll look more or less like originals, uh, they'll be clearly painted rather than injection molded, right? But they'll look good. Um, here are some other examples. Uh, this is a GoTech, so one of the things that makes me cringe, maybe some of you have done this, but I hate looking at uh, these Ataris and Amigas and various computers that have just had been hacked and a GoTech shoved in the side, sticking out. Um, I would like something that's either A, non-destructive, and B, aesthetically pleasing, it looks like it belongs. So in both of these cases, the photo that you see on the left there, you've got a GoTech in the drive bay, and you stick your USB in, but to control it, you've got that little like thing that comes from the top and has a nice um, uh, a rotary encoder on top of it, and it's non-destructive, so the wires are going through the vent there. If you want to take it out, you could. Uh, even better, that Amiga on the uh, right there, that floppy disk is actually 3D printed. It's not even a disk. It's actually a 3D model of a disk. Uh, only the half that you see. The rest of it is a is a 3D printed mechanism that is on a rail that slides the disk in and out. Sliding the disk in engages it and quote unquote inserts the disk. Sliding it out lets you uh, click these little buttons on the side and select your files. Um, it's a difficult print, but <laughs> if you tackle it, you'll get something that looks just awesome. Uh, and again, totally reversible. Um, we were talking about NABU's earlier. So uh, one of the cool things about NABU, I think, uh, that uh, Stephen was talking about is how intense the development has been recently on it. Like everybody's like, let's develop for this, right? So um, the interface adapter that you see there uh, on the keyboard there, so that's just the same interface adapter that you get on uh, Amazon and then you uh, hack some cables too. But somebody almost immediately came out with a, a case enclosure for it that matches the ID of the NAVI. Uh, and so you print that out and it looks like it belongs there now. Um, the controller there, some might recognize that as the Fairchild Model F controller, or Channel F, sorry, Channel F controller. Um, that was what NAVI was using. They were mm -hmm. using, I think, I think they modified them, but they're using Channel F controllers. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than regular joysticks. Why, I don't know, I, that was what was available, I guess. Um, but uh, somebody said, hey, let's not 
steal these from the Fairchild community. Let's make our own. Uh, so that one there is actually printed with, um, uh, I want to say it's printed with a combination of um, ASA and ABS, so it's really durable. You can't, kids won't break it. Uh, and it's just a 3D printed shell uh, with some primitive wiring. I mean, I think most of us have torn down a joystick to see how incredibly primitive they are inside. Uh, you can make your own joysticks really easily. Uh, let's see, um, case enclosures. See, that's a, that's, oh, that's not a GoTech, that's a grease weasel. The thing on top there is just another example of a, of a protective housing. That's one of those OPL things that goes in the parallel port. Uh, the thing on the left, which you can't see very well, that was printed in SLA. That's just a um, uh, Easy Flash cartridge. Uh, now, you can get the cases for Easy Flash when you buy the Easy Flash or online, but you can, there are files online. You can print your own, and they look pretty much just as good. In fact, that uh, doesn't show up in this photo here, but that's smoked like a smoked blue plastic. So you can see the, the stuff through it. Um, and then this, I think, is maybe the most fun. So specialty parts. Another use I found is one-off add-on parts for some weird esoteric purpose that only a few people have, or maybe just you have. Um, one example of one that's maybe a little more common is that thing on the left there. That's the common practice of, let's say, taking, desoldering the RF modulator out of a computer and then putting in like a VGA jack or an HDMI jack uh, and then terminating inside the, uh, inside the computer to some sort of an upscaler, right? And people with, the, like, I'm using Amigas as examples, but people with, like with the vampires and the pie storms and those sorts of things, they have to snake the HDMI cable out of their case in some some way, right? They got to get HDMI out or VGA out in the case of certain add-ons. Um, you can just 3D print a receptacle, put it in the back there. Uh, again, you're desoldering an RF module that you can resolder back in if you felt like, but that's going to look nice and stock in the back and be nice and durable. Um, the uh, the example on the right there. Uh, that's an example of internal cable routing. That's a GBA 1000, which is an Amiga replacement motherboard uh, that has internal USB. The USB needed to get to the back. So uh, I created a bracket that holds USB cables internally uh, so that it routes them nicely to the back. Again, I can't really see it in this photo, so let me skip forward. Um, that's strange. All right. All right, so here's some more examples of where I'm, what I'm talking about with like esoteric parts or one-off parts. So this is uh, on the left there, you see an Amiga that has an IDE controller on board. So if you know the Amiga 1000, you've got a power LED, you got a floppy LED. It never had a concept of having a hard drive internally. So there's no place for an LED. What most people would do is they pull the power LED and they put the hard drive LED there, or they pull the, the floppy drive LED, use the hard drive LED there. That makes sense because you can hear the floppy. You can't really hear a a modern day uh, SSD hard drive, right? Um, so that's what I did. The, the floppy light there is the hard drive light, activity light. Uh, but I still missed the floppy light, so what I did was I simply uh, went online, found a file that had a button for an Amiga 1000 floppy drive, hollowed it out, hollowed the model out, uh, printed that button, and then now I've got a hollow button. Uh, to that hollow button, I simply routed an LED from the button back to the floppy drive, uh, and then using SLA and some clear resin, I printed a, um, a lens to go over it, slapped all of that together, and you have what looks like a stock floppy eject button that is also the drive's activity light. Uh, again, completely non-destructive. I can, com I can reverse all of this if I felt like it. Um, and here's another example using the Amiga 2000, uh, that second drive bay, you can put another drive in there. A lot of people stick to GoTech there on a 2000, mm -hmm. uh, but there's so much stuff you could do there. So what I did was I simply created an enclosure that could take whatever upgrade I felt like, uh, in this case, uh, a hard drive activity LED, um, but also a USB port. But I, this could just as easily have been anything else. Um, actually, the, that's an interesting um, side note on that, that the floppy drive on that 2000 never works. I replaced it with a 4000s floppy, which I found to be is I think it's like half height, like whereas the Amiga 2000 is like two and two quarters height. 
slightly different. Somebody can correct me on this, but the but the uh, the height of the drive band a four thousand and, and a two thousand are different. Uh, so I had to extend that faceplate on the two thousand. Uh, so that faceplate is actually fake. It's uh, SLA printed, uh, and it looks fine. It looks completely smooth. Uh, again, the <laughs> floppy floppy drive light lens is uh, SLA printed. Uh, and you wouldn't really know it to look at it. So you can actually create some prints that look completely nice if, if you're trying to keep that as aesthetic. Um, I could go over some other examples, but I'm going to skip ahead to uh, what I call even more. So you've got a lot of other things that you can do once you have a 3D printing and are integrating it into your hobby. Uh, you can see that um, uh, my workbench here has a uh, tool case that I've gone and I've labeled everything using 3D printed color-coded labels. Um, can't really see that right down at the bottom, but there's like a little 3D printed screw holder. Uh, what I'm most happy with though is that 3D printed GoPro um, positionable uh, camera mount. That lets me tear down stuff, record it, and again, now I don't have to hold my cell phone above or, you know, precariously put my cell phone somewhere while I'm recording a tear down. Um, extremely useful for stuff like this. You can uh, you can also use it for storage. So another use that I that I have found for it is uh, cartridge holders obviously are maybe the, the, the most obvious thing but also uh, replacing lost cassette storage holders, all sorts of storage solutions for this. Uh, and then uh, there are some other tools. So uh, if you have an SLA printer one of the challenges is you need to cure resin, right? So to cure resin, you use UV light. Uh, to give it extra hardness, you oftentimes take it out of the printer and put it in a, in a dedicated UV light box. Um, so I made one, uh, and I put it on one of those little rotating little uh, uh, solar panel ro rotating thingies. Uh, and that's great, so you can like, think of a D&D miniature that would go on that and rotate around and, and harden. But um, what I found is it's actually ideal also for retro bright. So you can take small objects and put it in a chamber like that and retro bright them. Um, and speaking of retro brighting, you can 3D print things like um, keycap holders that will actually hold your stuff submerged in a thin pool of um, peroxide water outdoors. And it will. In my opinion, it's, it's the best way to retro right? because mm. it's the, the least, I guess, um, just, it's, it's the least, what am I trying to say here? It's, it's the, the, the least chance of that sort of uh, marbling effect that you get when you're retro biting things. Mm. Um, and again, that, these are just 3D printed keycap stems, right? So rather than repairing a keyboard, I'm just using them to hold those keys down. Um, again, there's just tons of tools that you can make to help us in this hobby. And then finally, uh, art projects, um, tons of art projects you see, that's like probably the thing that most people are using 3D printing for right now, but in our hobby, very useful, that Commodore, you can barely see that Commodore pet there is, is a functional Raspberry Pi based pet, right? The little Amiga ball there uh, was printed with a one color printer uh, and is nice, hefty three dimensional ball. Um, even the shelves there on were 3D printed, those wood shelves. Uh, next to that, that retro cave, that tabletop arcade, uh, completely 3D printed, right, other than the screen. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, practical considerations for 3D printing, like what, what I had, kind of the tips and tricks I found in relationship to our hobby. So, um, PLA, it's kind of the go-to filament, still go-to material that we're still printing stuff out of. Uh, but one thing I wanted to mention, uh, there are companies starting to produce filament specifically for retro use or specifically for us. Uh, so you'll get like Printed Solid has that Jesse PLA uh, in, uh, I think they, they have one color called Tan X, which is Commodore 64 red bin color. Uh, they have a color called um, uh, Jesse PLA 500, I think, or Beige 500, which is the Amiga 500's color. Um, if you know the, like, the RAL colors or the Pantone colors, there are services, of course, that just have filament that is in that, you know, color already. Uh, I found that there's a company called Paramount that specializes in um, some of these esoteric colors, and people have shown me uh, the equivalent RAL number for the Commodore colors, 
and I've gone out and the stuff that you see printed on this table were printed with that Paramount filament uh, and are a great match, right? Um, now, uh, other practical considerations, um, TPU, like I said, is, is useful in our hobby. Uh, PETG is relatively useful in our hobby. It's a material that, once it's printed solid, has a little bit of flexure to it um, and a little bit more durability. Uh, one issue with some of these 3D prints is that they can be brittle, but uh, you can get around that. Um, anything beyond that, though, requires some kind of extra consideration. Maybe it requires um, ventilation, maybe it requires heating or other, other considerations. Uh, but for the most part, these basic three uh, materials will suit most purposes. Um, what else? Sandable PLA uh, is a fairly recent innovation. Um, PLA, which is, the, again, the basic material, has been notoriously hard to work after you print it because it does not like to be sanded. Uh, but that's, uh, that's something that they've overcome. Um, I think I mentioned before you can self-level. Uh, you need self-leveling primer and then sand, right? If that's something you'd like to do, that's what, that's what I do for a lot of my projects, that um, retrocade thing that I showed there uh, that was uh, simply primed and sanded until it was smooth enough to be uh, hit with glossy paint. Um, speaking of coloring though, so PLA uh, can be painted but it does um, suck up color and so you might get some uh, capillary action if you just try to like you know paint straight onto it uh, so it does need to be primed first. Um, but you can color change uh, on even basic printers. There's all sorts of techniques to get even a printer with just one hot end, one filament running into it. Uh, you can get color changes in a bunch of different ways, uh, which I, I won't really go over here, but, but there are some, very, some fairly simple ways, including simply taking um, a printer while it's running and yanking the filament out and shoving other filament in really quick. <laughs> like, uh, it's been done. Um, in the case of the uh, Boing ball there, which is red and uh, white, uh, that's simply a model that was cleverly enough constructed that you print like five pieces in white and four pieces in red and you slap them together and it works. Or, or even just gluing certain pieces together. Um, and in the case, the last thing, vinyl wrapping is actually something I've been doing more and more of lately. Um, if you want to give something a nice finished look, uh, you can simply take uh, inkjet printable vinyl, yes. print onto it, and then put it on a finished surface. And it looks great. Uh, in fact, um, most people don't realize that that was 3D printed. Like, I, I rarely would encounter somebody that would actually know that it was a 3D printed object. Let's see, speaking of resin, so resin printers have other considerations. Uh, Maybe one of the bigger ones is the build volume, which is usually smaller. So you can usually only print smaller things, especially given the dimensional accuracy challenges of printing larger things. Uh, also, there's lots of cleanup stuff that you got to do. Um, there's also that it, that I think I alluded to a, a UV hardening requirement after the thing's printed. So there's there's just extra post processing stuff that you've got to do. Um, I would say that. Um, for dimensional accuracy, I think I did mention that um, uh, I didn't know this, so maybe other people don't know this. It's some of the uh, software that prints with these printers, there's actually a button hidden in a menu somewhere that says, be more dimensionally accurate. And it's like, <laughs> huh, that's useful. So you can <laughs> click on that. that. Nice. Um, but the other thing that I always turn on, and I realize was a mistake, and my son was telling me it was a mistake, but I just wasn't listening, is anti-aliasing which does increase resolution, it does it at the cost of accuracy. It does it at the cost of that dimensional accuracy, so turn it off. Uh, what else? Um, there is something called ABS-like resin, which is the go-to if you are using a SLA printer for any of our stuff, you wanna print something that's not gonna break, use this ABS-like resin. It's pretty good. Uh, and then finally, um, fle uh, oh, flexible resin, I haven't tried, so I can't give any opinion on that. I would really like to try it. Uh, but translucent resin is probably what I do the most with this, and you can see an example above there. Uh, so that, that hard drive power LED thing, that is 3D printed with a uh, FBM printer. However, that lens cap over it was printed with an SLA mm -hmm. printer, and so the two print styles were combined together to make that finished look. Um, and then uh, 
I want to say that one on the bottom there was also printed in a translucent resin. I think it was meant to be backlit, but instead I think what my son did was he applied a, a tin effect to the back side of it that shines through uh, and gives it a very 70s look, which is what we were going for, like late, late 70s look. Unfortunately, it doesn't come through on this slide particularly well. Um, but these are these are things that you can do with resin printers to get like some of this old school look. All right, almost done. So sourcing objects to print. Um, I think most people know about Thingiverse. Uh, there are a bunch of online websites that are repositories. Um, most of them are um, open source, right? So or Creative Commons, that sort of thing. Um, there are a few that you'll, if you get into this, there are a few that you'll probably use as a go-to. But I would also say that places like GitHub will sometimes uh, have the 3D files for the things that they are, if it's a hardware project, the hardware project they're producing, will sometimes have 3D files submitted to it. Uh, the other thing, though, is um, I would say that this usually, what I have found is I can usually at least find a starting point if I go out to any of these sites like Thingiverse. So in the example here, that's the monitor there. Uh, that monitor was an awesome model. Um, it was really well designed. It was good for 3D printing. Uh, I tried it. It didn't work because the, uh, the parts I was trying to pour inside it didn't fit. Uh, so I just needed to open it up with some 3D CAD software uh, and uh, edit it. And then it's pretty typical that when somebody edits this software, they will then upload the edits as a you know, they call it a remix here, but they'll, they'll upload those edits, and then those will be discoverable on the main page. So here's an example of the source, and then that one on the right is the edited version. Uh, and so now there's two versions of this monitor up there, uh, which you double your chances of getting the right bits for it. But even if you didn't have the right bits for your purpose, you could still probably uh, work with all of the stuff. And as far as working with it goes, um, I know a lot of us probably have some experience with 3D software. Um, I personally, I, I've used Fusion 360 and a bunch of other, like, of the more common 3D software. In Windows, I just use uh, 3D Builder, which is the equivalent of Microsoft Paint, it's just, or the equivalent of Notepad, right? It's just incredibly primitive. Um, but I've had really good luck because if all you're doing is editing a part, no big deal. All right, so hopefully you've enjoyed seeing some of the ways that you can apply 3D printing to your projects. Um, or maybe some applications you hadn't thought of. Is there anything I'm missing? Any questions? I have a question about uh, um, a replacement parts specifically. I, I'm willing to bet that there are pretty good uh, models for most things I would want out there. What is your opinion on the quality of the uh, quality and scope of the uh, models that are available for replacement parts for retro computers? I'm super stunned. Um, I'm super stunned at how uh, how easy it is to find really strange parts that I thought maybe I'm the only one that's looking for. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's been great. I would say that um, the quality of the parts depends on the skill level of the individual mm. who made it. Um, if it's not quite good enough for your purpose, then it's usually not hard to modify. The one thing that I would say is um, when somebody designs a part, uh, to replace X on an, on an old computer or something like that. Uh, when somebody designs a part, there's, they're probably going to design it to be printable on the thing that they use. So that could be a resin printer, it could be an FDM printer, it could be a printer that has two colors, or capable of, um, of printing in one style of filament and then using a, a dissolvable support filament. So they might have created the file in a, in a way that isn't quite the way that you do it, meaning that you may have to like either edit the file, reorient it, other things. Actually, the most common thing, to be fair, is um, um, they'll they'll have a large printer, and it'll be like a long part or something like that, and they'll go, that's no problem, I got a large printer, so they make a long part, and they print it, and they go, here it is, here's the file. <laughs> well, your printer's this big, so you, you'll definitely have to split the part, and then, okay, now you've split the part, is that a structural issue right. that you've introduced, right? So uh, these are considerations, but again, pretty easy to get around for the most part. Uh, did you say 
Uh, have I used uh, milling? Uh, yeah, sorry, I can't quite hear. Is there, is there a plastic that's better if you were going to like, put the part in the milling machine and clean it up? Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, I, thank you. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, uh, are there any plastics that are millable or can then be machined afterwards? Um, I actually think that, um, uh, I think that a lot of the resin prints are very millable without really like ha taking any damage from it or, or, ha or exhibiting any weird side effects. As far as the FDM, which is probably what you're thinking about, um, there are filaments that are much more post-processable in all sorts of ways, including milling. Um, the, the actually, as far as giving any specific recommendation, I, I don't know that I would give a, a specific recommendation, but I would say that when printing, one of the things that they try to do is they try to save, they try to save you money, time, and filament by printing things in a cardboardy way, like where you've got sort of an infill that is a pattern inside, and so there's a lot of empty space in there. Uh, and so if you're doing, if you're going to do like a mill and drill process where you're actually drilling through then you need to be aware of that. And the easiest way to do that is just tell the printer, hey, fill up the entire space here. And then you'll be left with a solid piece that you can probably drill. Anybody else? I have another, cool. qu I have another oh. quick question. I, uh, uh, I'm thinking specifically about replacing retro parts that do have some kind of structural element, that probably because they're, they, they fail, they're common to fail. Um, is there a, a, a process or plastic that you recommend specifically for uh, mildly structural replacement parts? Or it, it, it does it not matter at this scale so much? It's just regular P PLA on a... It, um, so yeah, so the question is like, if, if you think it's going to be taking stress over its, its continued life, like what's, yeah. what's the good material to use? Like I said earlier, for resin, there is ABS like they call it, um, and that's what I would go to. For FDM, I would say um, there are actually so many different materials that you can it's, you can be like a kid in a candy store and just kind of like pick the material that you think works best. If it's an internal part or part that people don't see, then I personally, there's like a bunch of materials, I personally use PET-G because it's got a little bit of flex and it's not gonna, not gonna break it with stress. Um, but that's internal. Uh, PET-G tends to have a glossy, Water bottle plastic. This water bottle plastic has a has a glossy look to it that doesn't necessarily look good externally unless you're gonna, intending to paint it. Uh, if it's something that you intend to paint, then uh, or or something that you intend people to see the outside of, then you may be stuck with PLA just because that's the only thing you can get the color that you want. Uh, in which case, they have PLA, which is generally called like PLA plus or tough PLA, some, something like that, which is going to be fine in most cases. Um, similar to the earlier thing about um, uh, considering how to print something, uh, the, the thing to keep in mind is that with almost all 3D printing it's layered, and so if something's going to break, if a 3D part that you're using as a replacement part is going to break under stress, it's going to break on those lines. Mm -hmm. So if you notice that, hey, this door, like people opening and closing this door causes stress on this, um, on, on the contact point here. Um, and that's why it keeps breaking. I would say that um, with 3D printing, what you would want to do is you want to make sure that when it prints, you print the part orientated in such a way that those lines aren't in that same uh, uh, plane of stress that it was taking earlier. Uh, uh, Ray Carlson, in his repairs, uh, always looks for the upper can I put it? The, the key cap stems for a C128. You get, oh, you, you can't find key cap stems? Well, the, the upper keys, they're a different length than the regular the key caps. So the key caps I'm talking about are like no scroll and, and uh, the, 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 those upper keys up there, up higher on the keyboard. He says, oh, those are longer. Those stems are longer than the rest of them. What I have to do, Robert, is I have to swipe stems from other C128s that are dead. I said, isn't there anyone who makes a 3D print of an the upper upper stems of C128 keycaps? So where would I look? 
or, or, or where would Ray look uh, to find such a such a design? It's that's scary because if he's looked and not found it, um, mm. there that could indicate that there's some reason why they're not readily makeable. Um, 3D printing, it, it's, it's actually lends itself to some of these structures because um, 3D printing doesn't have some of the issues that injection molding has. It doesn't have to be released from a mold. You can print things that have, an, have uh, empty space that you couldn't mold. So 3D printing, you can usually make just about anything. Uh, my concern is that if you're not finding it in the usual places that you look for these files, uh, I'm wondering if there's like a really thin point on it or some something about the geometry that when 3D printed it just doesn't seem to last and maybe that's why they're not doing it. So it would be worth us looking Thingiverse is the place to the first place to start but the but after yeah, Thingiverse there's you know literally like half a dozen other very large repositories of these files. So we can look for it and find okay. out uh, and then look for it and reevaluate it because sometimes it might be that five years ago it wasn't worth anybody's effort to try to print because it wasn't going to be good enough for the purpose, uh -huh. but maybe now in 2023 or beyond, maybe it becomes like, oh yeah, nowadays printers can actually do that and, and it'll work. So here's another question. I have this 3D printed uh, case for my SD to IEC and I paid the good $10 for this 3D printed case. Take a look at that. Is that is that made out of resin or what's that made out of there? <clears throat> it just comes apart. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna light here. Hang on. This is this is an individual individual question. Sorry about that. I can tell you that it is resin. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you can see it's like from a structure standpoint, it's good. So it looks great. Um, yeah, and you can actually, if you look really carefully. Actually, I can't tell. It looks like it was printed in this orientation. You can almost see in the C. You can see some. Hmm. Some layer lines, but yeah, that looks fantastic. And once it's painted, it would be indistinguishable from <laughs> some commercial part. Uh, I don't want to pick it. It looks fine like this. Any other questions, guys? For Rob? Okay, thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you.